So hi everybody, I'm Priya and this is a really special day. I didn't realize this when Hege invited me to speak. So I left Nokia a year ago and suddenly I see these shoes from Tom and it's like a full cycle. And it's a very special moment. So all of those guys who got blue badges or pink badges and are thinking of leaving their job and following their heart or their mind, I think you can do it. And you can also do it without funding. So today is a story of bootstrapping something which really bothers you and I'm going to walk you first to a bit of design philosophy. I'm a designer by profession and then uh, basically tell you a bit about what we're doing with Changeify. So we all live in neighborhoods, right? Some good, some not so good. And we all face common problems, whether they are potholes in the street, access to like affordable childcare, better parks. So how many of you guys have this Similar problems. Can I have a show of hands? Quite a few of us. That's interesting, isn't it? So where do you go when you have this problem? Do you write to the council? How many of us love to complain? It's so cathartic, isn't it? It's like, yeah, I'm going to send this awful letter to Guardian or to the South Council and feel really good about it. I'm going to like talk about it on Facebook. But the end of the day, <laughs> You're stuck with the problem and you're still, you know, haven't gone far. But even more interestingly, you start talking to other people and you say, you know, you can actually solve this thing. It's not so hard and complicated. You go to the pub, have a pint, talk to your friends. So you have a solution. And where do you go after that? Brilliant. It's very hard and I tried it. So that's why I started Changeify. So Changeify is actually a mobile crowdfund platform to create better neighborhoods. And I'm going to walk you through a bit of the story, where this comes from. So you might think she's crazy. Why is she showing us a disabled toilet? How many of you guys like disabled toilets? Come on. We've all been to the airport. We're all queuing for the bloody toilet. We all kind of sneakily go to the disabled toilet. <laughs> we got all luggage around us. We all like it. Come on, guys. We've all had a couple of drinks. Time for confession. Show of hands. Who likes disabled toilets? Right, the reason we all like disabled toilets, it's because of universal design. This is very interesting. Somebody somewhere thought that we all share similar issues. It's not just somebody on a wheelchair. It's not just somebody who has a problem. But because by solving the problem of somebody has a wheelchair, a lot of other people also get benefited. And that's my philosophy of design. Design should not have to be about young people, old people, black Asians, minors, midgets. I really don't care. I really think design should solve a problem and should benefit everybody. And I really miss this because one of the reasons, and I'm glad to have this platform today, is one of the reasons a lot of funding organizations also ask is, are you solving a problem for young people? Are you solving a problem for a specific issue? The fact is we are a crowdsourcing platform. We don't know what problem they're going to solve. You guys are going to tell us what problem you want to solve. I have no freaking clue. Because <laughs> you have the intelligence. You guys are smart. And I think this is very important because we're getting into a society where we don't mix as generations. We actually have a lot of knowledge in older generations. And we create these weird barriers where there's less knowledge exchange. So tomorrow, when you guys go and decide to start something, I'd really urge you to try and mix generations, mix different people up, because there are so much of information and knowledge between different groups. And by segregating them as very specific needs, we are making exactly the same mistake that the old economy has been making. So, backstory. A year ago, so I used to head uh, mobile phones at Nokia, which is more phones for emerging markets. I was doing the user experience. That's my mother struggling with the phone. She'll kill me. <laughs> her photo's up here. <laughs> she doesn't look very happy because, you know, the classic designer thing, can my mom use a phone, you know? Yeah, she, you know, moms can't use stuff. My mom's actually pretty smart. She chooses Skype. She's on Google+. Plus. She actually taught me how to use Hangout because all our kids are in different countries. We don't come from a very rich background. You know, my parents are in Mumbai. They're using the internet. They have to be in touch with us. There's no way my father's going to let my mom call us on the phone landline all the time. And she's a hacker. My mom is a hacker. She figured out before anything else how the hell to figure out technology. She said, you know what? Can you just design for me a decent phone that this works? It's got a good bad battery life. So I said, okay, I'll go and join a company which I think probably can do this. And I went and joined Nokia. It'll be good to solve that problem. And I've had this kind of trait. So this is what I'm talking about, my personal story. So I used to work before Nokia at BBC. 
And I can proudly say that <laughs> I had a sackable offense. I didn't pay the license fee. And I was a BBC employee. Because I actually thought the license fee is not really a good idea. You can all come after this talk and come and kill me for saying this. But I designed the first version of iPlayer. And the reason I've, I feel strongly about these things are sometimes you're designing habits and behaviors for what actually needs to emerge. You don't have to maintain existing business models or status quo. And this is a personal aha moment. You know, this is, uh, I mean, I was at BBC when I was, you know, 24, 25, really young Turk, you know, you're thinking being really anarchic and changing the world. And yeah. But one of the things that really touched my heart was this story when I was working at BBC World Service. You know, when you're a bit cocky at work and you don't realize the impact of what you're designing, and this was a story about this guy who has been in Iraq for nearly 20 years underground, and <laughs> he has lost all his teeth. He's using um, a radio, and basically he's showing over here that the only way his connection to the world was BBC World Service. And this is when, for me, the aha moment happened about what is it that I do at work. Why do I bother to get out of bed in the morning? Because I love to sleep, actually. You know, there needs to be something that's worth it. And these are the kind of things which merely makes me feel like, you know, if, if all of us had something that really made it worth it to get out of bed in the morning, then we'd all be in a better place. We probably won't even be in the current economic crisis. So when I was working at Nokia, traveling around the world, speaking to people in different countries, didn't matter whether it was India, Africa, in different countries in Africa or Brazil, one of the things that came out a lot was this thing about resilience in communities. And this is something that really struck my heart. You know, people didn't have to have much money. You know, we've spoken about microfinance and other kind of things. But what I really took courage of was a lot of people with even very less money would come together and tap on their community spirit to really figure out how to deal with adversity. And this, when I talk about resilience, is about being faced with adversity and bouncing back and really making the best of the situation. But when I came back to Camberwell, <laughs> where I live, I've been living there for 12 years. Every day as we walk down the street, I used to see stuff like this. And it's really annoying, actually, because you keep complaining. I could write a letter to South Council saying, oh, there's a payday loan, there's a chicken shop, betting shop. But you know, I was saying, you know, I'm a designer. I, I know how to solve problems. I must be able to do something about this. And down the street, friends of mine in Brixton had already had some success doing things like this, which is the Brixton Pound. So there was already like a, ground, a groundswell happening about alternative systems on solving problems. And again, like you know, a couple of others have already said in the talks today, none of the stuff that we're doing is new. I don't know how many of you guys have read Designing for the Real World. I really urge you guys to read Victor Papernick's book. It's from the 70s. And uh, he really thought designers are evil. We heard from Chris about you know making landfill and how you can make a beautiful landfill. But fact was, Victor Papenek was really against useless products. And here I was designing mobile phones for one of the largest manufacturers, creating more landfill. So all of this kind of came together, and I was thinking about these things as I was coming back from my several trips abroad, seeing what's happening in the high street. And at the same time, I was looking at the city, London, because I'm a cyclist. And it's good because it kind of keeps you alive. Keeps you young, your every time the adrenaline, just going around Elephant and Castle. But um, this is a story, because I love this guy. His name is Christ uh, Christopher Alexander. He's talked about the pattern language of city. And if you think about city like a sandwich, there are different layers to it. And there is on the, on the bottom level, there's this infrastructure level where you know, the tube and the pipes just have to work. The plumbing has to work. On top of that, you have the people and activities. And then on top, you have another whole system going on. And this very much mirrors how mobile operating systems work. I'm sorry, you can't see that very well. So one of the reasons I started thinking about the pawn shop and betting shop down my street, and starting putting my good old software hat on, thinking, OK, if you think about the city as an operating system, and you think about the bugs in the neighborhood that you have, and I don't mean bug as in just reporting to the council, but really figuring out what kind of application protocol interfaces you need in the community to solve these issues, you could get to some very interesting solutions. And this kind of really happened, you know, when you have the Eureka moment. Unfortunately, I wasn't in a bathtub. I had an accident with this pothole outside my street. <laughs> this is actually uh, when I was cycling. And uh, all these thoughts were going in my head, and I managed to get myself in a bad situation with this pothole. And I wrote to Sata Councils exactly a year ago. You can see the dates. 
I wrote to my counselor. I told him, you know what? I can crowdsource all the potholes on Camberwell Road with all the other cyclists. So I know you don't have a budget. I can figure out which are the most potentially dangerous ones. This way, you have a cheat sheet to solve the problem. Nothing happened. Six months, nothing happened. But meanwhile, bless my friends, I put this up on Facebook. And you can see my friends are indulging me. I put it up on Twitter. But I had a lot of support saying, yeah, you know, actually, it's a good idea. We could do something. And this was the turning point for me to actually say, OK, this was almost like what you'd say in software. You'd say creating a minimal viable product. You make something small and see, OK, are the people interested to do something? And I said, OK, so you can actually kind of create something where people come together and are interested to solve an issue. And again, going back to the history, um, what I like about some of the things from medicine and biology, talking about Edward when he says mathematician, I always like to look at nature for solutions. And you know, you use a virus to kill a virus. I wanted to use payday loans, betting shops, to kill the whole issue of payday loans and betting shops. And I thought, what do people love? People love lotteries. And lotteries are old. I mean, think about all the lottery-funded buildings and the lottery-funded stuff in the UK. It's amazing. And lottery is not just old. It's before Christ. So the Great Wall of China is the first officially recorded lottery-funded uh, building in the world because the emperor of China was trying to protect people, and he didn't have the money. So he actually crowds, uh, crowdfunded it through by issuing these lottery tickets. Now, you, I'm saying giving all this information to you just because it's very hard to solve a systemic problem in a neighborhood by just focusing on one issue. You have to work with the economics. You've got to work with the community aspect. You've got to work with the cultural aspect. And by trying to join the dots between all these different issues, hopefully, we would have a solution. So I'm just going to quickly walk you through what we've been doing. So Changeify, the way our platform works, a little story. So John, if you can imagine John, he's based on people like you and me, or you know, he's got a problem. His problem really is that he has his bike stolen regularly. And he's quite tired of the dog litter issue. Highly unsexy problems, but we all face it. So he's walking down the street. He sees Changeify on one of the mom and pop shops, takes a photo. He goes directly to the service. And luckily, there's a dog walking in front of him doing his business. And uh, very handy. Takes a photo and says, oh, we need to do something about this. And we need to put bags around the neighborhood. But when he does that, somebody else in another neighborhood put, takes a photo and puts it back in the feed, saying, now, we tried this just down the street. You want to have a go at that? And this is something I really miss in a lot of council and citizen-based systems, is how do you crowdsolve an issue? All the stuff we face right now, many people have faced it as well. Many people have solutions. But we don't share these solutions. And it's quite easy with the kind of technology we have to do this. So he goes in front of his house, takes a photo of the bike parking issue. And when he does this, he shares it. It goes just like I had done before with the portal stuff. It goes across Facebook where his neighbor Tejal sees it and likes it. And it spreads like wildfire through the neighborhood. But at the same time, talking about systemic change, on the other side, businesses which have signed up to the platform. So here we have businesses like Starbucks who haven't paid the corporate tax. And Starbucks has a real problem. Brands like Starbucks have lost the consumer trust at the grassroots level. But at the same time, they're trying to find that way back. So here Sally, who's the marketing manager for Starbucks, who has a login on the system, sees that John's project of the bike parking issue is getting a lot of traction. She takes the ad inventory that she normally spends on Facebook and backs it on that particular project. Because it's very difficult for brands to get hyper-local footfall to their local branch where uh, Starbucks is based neighborhood. Meanwhile, this is Evergo. He's actually from Camberwell. He's just started a coffee shop. This is not the big brands. The small businesses as well who don't want to spend money on Google Ads and stuff like that can also back projects because it's literally just where the issue is in their neighborhood. And when this happens on the other side, Councillor David gets a notification and he realizes that the project that he's been tracking has actually been backed. And because his budgets have been cut, he gets an easier understanding of what are those issues that people are reporting and what are the things that business are interested in solving. So it's a way of a win-win-win situation. Time flies. People come together. John actually gets volunteers from the neighborhood coming and giving resources. Not everybody is about giving money. It's about giving resources. They earn points on the system. And over time, these projects take a long while. 
what happens really is John and others who worked on the project, just like Air Miles, earn neighborhood loyalty points. And these loyalty points can be used in any participating shop in the neighborhood because when you volunteer, when you're doing good work, you might as well earn those points and go and support your local businesses. And I know you hear this like a large business like Starbucks, but it doesn't matter when a small shop that is participating can get the footfall. So this sounds wonderful. How the hell do you make this a reality? And that's what we've been doing for the last six, seven months. We've been running these neighborhood events in different places around London. And we've been doing these neighborhood walks where we give people a piece of chalk. They can chalk their feeling about what they think about a particular issue. They take a photo and upload it. And we also have a stall at the farmer's market where it's not all about digital. People can actually you know, physically have face-to-face -face meetings and they also put issues on a map that they see locally. We've done this in Elephant Castle in Camberwell. And then basically, we've also got the council involved. So here we have the planner from Southern Council involved to see what are the issues. And we've also made it fun. The main thing about social stuff is you don't have to feel like, with all respect to Mother Teresa, that you're kind of changing the world. It really has to feel like fun. So we're trying to make something more about storytelling, where people are creating little postcards. They can talk about the issue and share that with their friends. We have an online platform, which we're going to do a new version of, where these videos are there about the projects and the, and the people are actually backing it. I'm not going to talk more about this, but um, what we have done right now is quite scary. So we've gone and poked the bear in the cave, and the bears come out. So now we've been, we're going to be working with the Guardian Data Unit and the Neighborhood Forum in Elephant to crowdsource the Haygate neighborhood plan. And this is going to be very interesting, because the whole Elephant Castle issue as you all know, is quite a prickly one. So the question I have is, what is the one habit or behavior that you would change that makes you feel like getting out of bed in the morning and look forward to something?